coming up on Theater Talk. Good thing you're a Shakespeare actor because uh, when you when you do a song like A Little Priest, you better have the verbal dexterity to handle the yeah. Sondheim lyrics. Well, even more importantly, night music. In view of her penchant for something romantic, to sod is too trenchant and Dickens too frantic, and stand all would ruin the plan of attack, as there isn't much blue in the red and the black. <laughs> they should use that in acting classes. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. <laughs> I wore my Burberry. Oh, God, yes. My scarf. You certainly did wear that scarf. Well, I had to. It was costly. It was a nice scarf. Your father bought it for me, but I wore it anyway. <laughs> it was smart looking. I was well put together. My trench coat, my scarf. Your absent gaze. And that's when I had my affair. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Coming up, we have everybody's favorite retired chief of police, Len Carreyou, but first... <laughs> but first, we have a fine new play on Broadway uh, produced by the Manhattan Theater Club. It is called Our Mother's Brief Affair, written by Richard Greenberg, and it stars one of my favorite actresses of all time, the Aww. great Linda Lavin. Aww, Welcome back to Theater God. Talk. Thank you. Directed by Lynn Meadow, who has been running uh, Manhattan Theater Club well since its inception. Forever. Forever. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> One of the great theaters in New York. And the playwright Richard Greenberg. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we have to say that there is a, uh, a few plot twists in this play, so we can't give things away. Yeah. But Richard, if you can, for people who haven't seen the play, just give us a sense of what it's about and what got you thinking about this subject matter. Uh, well, it's about a mother who had a brief affair. I don't want to give away too much. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> the for, title. You and stick to the title. You're okay. <laughs> the, the title is only slightly misleading, and um, and uh, it has ramifications beyond uh, what that suggests, which is what we're not talking about. And what got me started with it on it was, um, all right, I can speak obliquely. I read a book. Uh, that was very important to me. It was a book of history, mm -hmm. and I instantly wanted to appropriate it. Mm -hmm. And so I did, and luckily we, I got away with it legally because the author is fine. And, it, and there's a historical character we're not going to give away. Thank you. But it is actually, I found, Lynn, uh, quite shocking. Uh, and not everyone would, would know who this histor historical person is. But, but they should. But what mm. comes out should. of who he is and what time that this play represents yes. and what America was like. Exactly what America was like and I think as Rich points out it's a, a similar situation in America when the play takes place in 2003 in a post 9-11 world, mm -hmm. a world that was similar with filled with anxiety and concern about what mm -hmm. the future would be and so all that is the backdrop for mm -hmm. this great story about the brief affair. That you had. That, that, in that, your youth. That this lovely character, this lovely, interesting woman, in her youth, she says, I was hardly a, a older than you two are now. She but says she's talking to her children. To her, children <laughs> yeah. her grown children, who are probably in their 40s, and they're just so horrified that their <laughs> mother, who has to only have been their mother, had had a, an affair. And she says, I wasn't dead yet. One of the reasons I wanted to do this play, other than many other reasons, because I've never worked with Rich before, I've never worked on any of his plays, and so happy to be invited and read it. And uh, when I got to uh, a piece of the play where she gets to declare her passion for a life of her own. Mm -hmm. I knew I had to play it. I had to do it. I had to say that for myself and all the women I come from and all the women yet to come. Did you think of Linda when you were writing the play? Or? You know, when I was writing the play, I had no one in mind. But then we had a reading and we asked Linda and we asked Linda to do it, and she said, "Yes, it's a fascinating story." And he but could only think a, of Linda. I could after only after that. after the reading. <laughs> it was it's sort of it's it's very odd because you feel, after the fact, that you must have written it for the actor who merges so completely. Yeah, it seems that. like it was written. Yeah, well, I, Linda's your go-to actress, right, Linda? I mean, you guys had I, great I, success I, with Taylor. Somehow, Tale of the calling Alibis Linda Lavin my go-to oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, doesn't really convey how I feel about her. <laughs> The idea that I can call her and say, would you be interested in doing something, and that she says yes means she's, she's just my 
heart's desire. We have uh, had a beautiful time, mm -hmm. a time of real um, passionate concern for these people that we are playing, mm -hmm. and uh, a wonderful time connecting with this uh, extraordinarily talented and funny and mm -hmm. sweet and brilliant man. I've been a great admirer of Lindis for a long time, and I'm curious to know, how do you and we'll talk about you as if you weren't here for a moment, Linda. How do you direct a Linda Lavin? Because her instincts are so brilliant. I mean, this is a woman who can break your heart with a hand gesture like this and make you burst out laughing with a roll of the eyes like that. And then in one second have you ripping your heart out and yeah. having you in tears. Yeah. I, I think uh, one of the great gifts that I've had was the chance to work with Linda three different times. And I think what you describe as her gifts are the things that are exactly a joy for a director to to have the opportunity to work with an actor whose instincts are so strong and whose intelligence is so great. And so there, there could be nothing better than to work with someone who has these instincts. So are you kind of and editing? And who's always what? truthful. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, think, I think directing is a process of editing and collaborating and um, f watching to see what an actor does and, and, and yet knowing where something is going, but going there with the actor, not trying to bring the actor to something that you see, but we're, and in the case of working with Linda, it's it's just a joyful journey to get to that place where Rich has conceived. We hear Rich, I hear Rich, and uh, in my you were going to say something about um... about the way that Lynn sees and the vision that she has and the clarity of her uh, uh, her articulation about that vision, so that it becomes. I'm always willing to learn, mm -hmm. and I appreciate everything you have said and you both have said about instincts. Beyond instincts is skill. Beyond Absolutely. skill, you know, is technique, and and also the knowing that you'll be repeating this behavior over and over again. Mm -hmm. That the rehearsal process is about exploring exploring the subtext. Lynn, I want to ask you, as a director, how much were you working with Richard before Linda entered the picture? What's involved there? I think Rich and I are very close, and, um, and he is obviously incredibly articulate about what he's written and what he's looking for, and I feel it's my job to translate his vision um, to the stage through working with the actors, but w we talked well, every night. <laughs> we talked every night during rehearsal and before, for months before we started. I mean, we'd meet up at this vegan restaurant across the street from me, and Lynn had the pencil in her hair and the notebook <laughs> and the questions, and I would answer the questions, and she'd say, ah, oh, good. <laughs> so how much and then did you rewrite after Lynn came on board? You know, um, the play was rewritten in, in a sort of... Um, dainty way, because it had been developing for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, it was new with an intermission when it had a previous production, and it was in one act, which, and at the time, I couldn't imagine how to divide it. Then it went away for a couple of years, and I looked and said, oh, there. <laughs> and it was just <laughs> so it. obvious. But I couldn't see it until I'd forgotten it. Now, and then, and so, and then there's, it was the very fine-tuning. It was, you hear the implications of what you've written in a different right. way, and you hear repetitions that you don't, uh, understand until you've been exposed to it. So, and when someone like Linda Lavin comes in, then do you begin to start tailoring lines for her because she's bringing something to the play. No, that you don't. Or no, you don't. You don't tailor. You don't need to tailor. Mm. She can do anything you give her. So, <laughs> it's just, you don't need to tailor. I'm not her. leaving this room. <laughs> no, it's true. no, but it's not. It's true. She's, she doesn't need. Tailor. I mean, there. Sometimes there are actors who can't do things, and then you sort of say, "Well, I never really liked that line anyway." And, oh, and then, oh, and then, oh, yeah. And, and then it somehow appears in the published edition. But, um, <laughs> but, but with Linda, it's not. With Linda, you know, the thing that's before everything you talked about in process. This is the thing that's. To me, and I hate all of this praise, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> but um, the thing about uh, Linda that I think you start with is this incredible resonance. Do you know what I mean? That it's just so. It's I once saw. This is going to seem like I'm on drugs, but um, <laughs> I once saw a few years ago Liza Minnelli on an old Ed Sullivan show singing "Didn't We" without a microphone and in a macro skirt, mini skirt, and micro skirt or something. <laughs> and I thought, you know, it's all about the way she stands. Mm -hmm. It's just standing there. It's not that she has the greatest voice, but she, the way she stands on a stage and takes in an audience is some incredible genius and it's so simple but mystical for being so Energy. simple Energy. and it's just it's a resonance that everything goes into the simplest thing and that's what happens when Linda walks into the rehearsal room and she's not dressed like Lynn Fontaine I don't believe oh. I mean usually it's kind <laughs> of but, but it's but there's all of this that you start with
Did you have that energy from the get-go? When oh, you were a little I, kid, did you were? You yeah. Were, oh, yeah. I yeah. was. Mm -hmm. I I I loved performing from the time so, I was from a the kid. Top, yeah. I sang on beaches for my mother's friends. I, <laughs> yeah, you did. You, you know, really? just say yeah, just say <laughs> the word. And I was Linda sang that. Were you that's four? That's right. Yes, I was four, <laughs> three. Was I was. Yeah. I sang in my crib. My mother said before oh. I spoke oh. that I stood up in my crib and sang "God Bless America." And for many years, I thought that I had written that song. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but she, we should have company, and she said, come to the, she's singing, and I, I it's maybe apocryphal, but it's a good dinner story, I guess, from my mother for all those years. She you sang before you spoke. Yeah, but did you want to be so, a, a oh, musical theater actress in the beginning? Because I think of you now as, no. as a serious, you know, non-musical theater performer. Yes. But of course, you were identified you. with, yeah. you know, Superman. And, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. because that was the way in. I could sing, so I could, I got, I could audition. Right. I could get to chorus calls, and that's how I first started in a, a show that Hal Prince directed, which is the first time he ever directed a show by John Kander and James Goldman. Oh, Family Affair. A Family Affair. How do I know? I was in the chorus of that show, and Hal gave me five speaking parts, five bucks a piece. <laughs> and then I moved out of the chorus to Superman because I could sing, I could get to auditions as an actor, which is what I wanted to be, a serious actor out of college. I couldn't get an agent without a job or a job without an agent. I couldn't get in the, those doors. Right. And so I got through the door uh, finally um, when I was invited to be in... Um, uh, the Little Murders, uh, right. and that was my first non-musical play, and that was it's clearly about six years after I'd come to New York, so I'd been doing only musicals. Right, right. And I certainly loved doing musicals. And I, you were great in Gypsy. I saw you. With thank that, you uh, very much. I loved doing the it. The 90s, I think it's it was. It's a killer. It's yeah, just with nice. Arthur Lawrence directing it. Yes. You survived Arthur. Ah, uh, well, was I'm he here, but <laughs> I don't know if I <laughs> Was he nice to you? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> One day he was nice. <laughs> um, no, nothing, no. He said more about that. Well, the play is uh, Our Mother's Brief Affair, uh, written by Richard Greenberg, starring Linda Levin, directed by Lynn Meadow at the Manhattan Theater Club. And before we go, I must ask you, Lynn, because I'm always curious in how people start. We think of the Manhattan Theater Club now as this big Broadway entity, but how much money did you have when you started the theater back then? Where did you get the money? And minus was... minus seventy five thousand dollars. <laughs> Nothing. When I when I was asked to become the artistic director of this theater, I thought, well, it's a good idea if I ask the board how much money they have, and <clears throat> they showed me a budget, and I said, oh, this looks very interesting. I see you have seventy five thousand dollars. Why do you have a parenthesis around the number? <laughs> That's how I <laughs> Come a long Great way, baby. <laughs> All right. Uh, don't miss our mother's brief affair. Combining the... compelling emotional family relationship with a very important historical event, mm. which we all need to remember. Mm. Yeah. Be prepared for some twists and turns. Thanks mm. for being our guest on Theater Talk. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Oh, fun. He was a city person, an urban gentleman. He was drinking coffee from an Acropolis cop. He was carrying the post. The Post? It was the 70s. The Post was different then. <laughs> was the newspaper for liberals? The Times was for liberals. The Post was for liberals who weren't good at folding! <laughs> and we are delighted to be joined by one of the great, great uh, Broadway actors, Mr. Len Cariou. Welcome to Theatre Talk. And Len has a new show called Broadway and the Bard, An Evening of Shakespeare and Song. Yeah. And I must say that so many people know you, of course, as the great musical theater leading man from A Little Night Music and Sweeney Todd, and they forget you were, in fact, a Shakespearean actor. Yeah, I started that way. Um, it was a career I really had before I ever got to Broadway. Um, and... Um, it so happened that uh, in in the uh, summer of of 1969, I did, I was at Stratford, Connecticut, mm -hmm. doing Henry V, and we managed to bring it into um, the amphitheater uh, at the end of the summer. During the summer, I was uh, auditioning. I auditioned three, four different times for applause before they finally gave me the, the job. So ever since then, I'd been thinking about maybe doing an evening of Shakespeare and song. Mm. So that's, this is when that started. So uh, I procrastinated a little. <laughs> 40 years or so. You something. might say, but uh, <laughs> anyway, it's, it's come to fruition and uh, it's and been great you, fun to put together. And are you doing um, uh, famous speeches from Shakespeare? And yes. Then 
Yeah, soliloquies from the great players, most, most of the roles I've played. Right. Um, and finding songs, Broadway shows, um, that either support the text of the, of the soliloquy or are the antithesis hmm. of it. But not necessarily musicals that were based on Shakespeare. Oh, no. Plays, not at all. Like Kiss Me Kate or something like that. No, no. You're finding songs from musical theater that reflect or go parallel or join with a soliloquy that you're doing. Exactly. Can, Can you, you give, give us an example of a soliloquy in a song that you would put together? The essence one is what I say inspired the whole evening. I do, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more close the wall up with our English dead. I can go through the end of it and then say, and at the end of it I say, I see you stand like greyhounds in the slip straining upon your start. The games of foot follow your spirit and upon this charge cry God for Harry, England and St. George. What is it that we're living for? <laughs> applause, applause. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> There are a lot of there are a lot of laughs in the in, this, in <laughs> Broadway at the bar. Uh -huh. And so, last we got you, if you won't mind taking us through your extraordinary life and career, um, what was the the first play you ever did as a kid? I mean, were you a high school theater kid? Yeah, the first or? play was uh, Rafe Rackstraw oh. in high school. Pirates of Penzance. Right. Yeah. 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 Rafe Rackstraw. So you were always a singer too, right? Yeah. I was the the Irish side of the family. I, my mom, my mother was a singer. Um, I had an uncle who was a great musician, mm. and there was a piano in the house. I just grew up with music all around me uh, from you know the get go. So I sang all the time. And and when when I when I studied as a boy soprano, I studied my vo voice. And then when time came for the voice to change, my then teacher said, well, you know, you may not have a voice hmm. after a year from now. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I won't be able to sing. And she said, well, sometimes that happens. So I never shut up from that time on. I just sang all through the voice break. I just never shut up. <laughs> I sang outside. I used to walk the streets singing my full head off. <laughs> uh, when did the... Um the love of Shakespeare and the sort of more classical. Well, that happened. Coming. That happened when I was uh, uh, in my early twenties. John Hirsch uh, founded the Manitoba Theater Center in Winnipeg. He became my mentor, and he engineered my going to Stratford, Ontario, um, and that's how I got there. As I say in the in the evening, I say my first, my first contract there I was as cast and you know which means that you're in every play and you're doing whatever the hell they tell you. Did you carry a spear Len? Yeah oh, absolutely. <laughs> it means you're a spear carrier of course that's exactly what it means. Yeah, and you were an important member of the of the Guthrie's original company. I had just missed Guthrie at Stratford Ontario mm. and the Guthrie theater was now in, in existence and uh and I think it's third year, and, and I, was going, I, I was asked by Douglas Campbell to join that company uh, because I'd been at Stratford for, for, I think, four or five seasons, and uh, it was time to move on. Mm -hmm. And so he said, well, come to the Guthrie. And, uh, and I said, oh, Corey, I'm cool. I'd love to, you know. Um, I get to play the, you know, I'd be the leading man in the company. And, uh, but I thought... Guthrie had just done um, something there, and, and then he was gone. Mm. Uh, and I thought, boy, I missed him again, you know. <laughs> and then it turned out that uh, uh, he wanted to do the House of Atrus. When Douglas said to him, well, you know, we've got uh, Len Carew and, and Robin Gamble and uh, these people, and they're going to be in your play. And, of course, he didn't know either of us, and I think he kind of went... Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> and he said, well, Douglas said to him, well, Tony, that's the way it is. So, you know, deal with it. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know this. We didn't know this, of course, when we went into rehearsal. But uh, that was, we found that out afterwards, that he was not, a, not entirely thrilled that we were going to do it. But he was pretty thrilled when he, when, the, when he got the result. Then you have this big musical theater career, I mean, you know, playing the great 
parts, originating the great parts in Little Night Music and Sweeney Todd. Did you want to go to the musical theater or were you like a serious classically trained actor and I want to do the real stuff and I got to do this stuff to make some, make a living this musical theater stuff? <laughs> well, you know what? It was actually, it was, it was the first time when we did applause, it was the first time I'd ever had that kind of employment <laughs> where I was making a really good dollar yeah. and I had a job for a year yeah. and more if I wanted it. And uh, so, yeah, there, there was certainly that to it. But at the end of the year, I went back to the Guthrie <laughs> um, because I, that's what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, got, then, then became a, an associate artistic director uh, and then got the chance to do night music. Uh, and I kept that, that association with the theater, and then I was going to go back and, and uh, uh, play Macbeth <laughs> yeah. after the year's run. That was, my, that was my reward, as it were, and I was, you know, I was thrilled to do it. And then Langham, Michael Langham was the artistic director, and he changed his mind and said, we're not going to do Macbeth, we're going to do Lear. And I thought, oh, crap, you know. <laughs> and he said, no, no, you'll play Lear. <laughs> They thought, oh, really I crap. Said, I'm 35. What are you talking about? <laughs> and he said, You could do it. You yeah. play, it's time you started doing those character parts. <laughs> and you when, did, Lear. And it you, changed my life. It yeah. sure did. When yeah. you got the script for Sweeney Todd, mm. what'd you think? I thought they were out of their minds. <laughs> uh, it, it, I was then the artistic director of the Mantle Theater Center in Winnipeg. After I'd done night music, and I went to I went to Winnipeg to to run the theater, and uh, Hal sent me he sent me the script. We had a conversation on the phone. He said, "By the way, Stephen's written a musical for you." By the way, for you, he wrote it for <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah, hmm. and I said, "Oh, really?" <laughs> by the way, you say this. By the way, <laughs> Stephen wrote a musical for me, <laughs> and I said, so he sent me the script. And I was in the middle of rehearsal of Equus, I believe it was. And I was running the theater and playing Dice Heart at the same time. And I had no really, you know, didn't know what day it was half the time. And I got the script and I opened it up just because I was excited. And I read the first couple of pages and I went, oh, good God. They're out of their minds. What are they thinking? So then I went home and on the weekend and I sat down and I read it. And I thought, well, maybe not out of their minds, but uh, I said, it's a little bizarre. And then I reread it and I thought, well, you know what? If he writes a really romantic score, it might work. Mm -hmm. When was the first time you heard that score? I mean, do you go over to Steve's townhouse there on the east side and he says, okay, I'm going to play through Well, this. actually, I did. You, we, you wouldn't normally do that, but I was, I was uh, going to have, I was going to have a film going to come back to Canada to do a film in, in uh, Alberta, in Banff. And uh, um, so I said, and we'd already set up a, a, a schedule for Sweeney Todd. And it was going to be in December. We were going into rehearsal. And the film overlapped with that. And they wouldn't give me a closing date. So I was going to miss the first week of rehearsal, which is... <laughs> excuse me, what you have with the principals right. and the composer. And so I was going to miss that. And I went to Hal and I said, do you think Stephen could give me some music so that I'm not behind the eight ball when I get back? And he went to Steve and Steve said, okay. And, and uh, so I did. I went over to his place and he played me what he had, a little priest. Oh, you uh, had that? That was one of the first ones that he did, huh? Yeah. And uh, the Ballad of Sweeney Todd, the opening of Sweeney Todd. Okay, well, it's a good Wait. thing you're a Shakespeare actor because uh, when, you, when you do a song like A Little Priest, you better have the verbal dexterity to handle the yeah. Sondheim lyrics. Well, but even more importantly, night music. Hmm. In view of her penchant for something romantic, disorders too trenchant and Dickens too frantic, and stand all but ruin the plan of attack as there isn't much blue in the red and the black. They should use that in acting classes. I use it as a warm-up all the time. Oh, you, oh, you do? You sure do? I oh, great, great. We just have one minute left, but I, I have to bring up Blue Buds. <laughs> She's addicted. Incredibly <laughs> popular show that you're on. It is. Yes, I am addicted. And I have to ask you, uh, and, uh, for those who haven't seen Blue Buds, on almost every episode, the family gets together and has dinner. 
and Sunday dinner. Sunday dinner. And I, and I and we always wonder, my husband and I would watch it, how much do they have to eat while they're shooting those dinner scenes? Because you're all pretending to eat. Right. Well, I, I avoid it as much as I can. <laughs> uh, and if you ever notice, they usually start on my back yes. at the beginning of the dinner. And then they work their way around the table because there's nine of us, right? So yep. they have to cover everything. Right. Uh, so it takes a, a, a goodly amount of time. So everybody is very judicious about when, are you on me? Well, then I'm not going to eat. <laughs> and the kids, of course, are feeding their faces. <laughs> uh, it's really funny. And, and, and Donnie Wahlberg, uh, for some reason, he's always eaten. Um, but he finally got it down to, he usually when he is eating, it's, it's vegetables. <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> uh, is the food any good on the set? Oh yeah, it is. It's pretty damn good. It's good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is why you become an actor, right? So you get oh, free, food, yeah, free food. food. <laughs> all right. Um, the show is Broadway and the Bard, an evening of Shakespeare and song, uh, performed, created by Len Carew. And what what theater are you at? Uh, the Lion Theater on Forty Second. Excellent. Right. And do we get a little Sondheim in this uh, show as well? Yep. Of course. All right. Uh, great pleasure having you as our guest tonight on the Theater Talk. Thanks for coming on, Len. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Susan. You. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.